Tonight we're going to begin in Psalm 34. We'll look at Psalm 34, 35, and then move into Psalm 36. Let's begin reading together in Psalm 34 at verse 1. And I'll read uh, verses 1 through 7, and we'll get into our study. Psalm 34, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 7. Uh, psalmist, the psalmist David writes, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. I sought the Lord and He heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. They looked to Him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear Him and delivers them. When I first got saved, this is one of the uh, psalms that we're actually, we, we actually sung this, and uh, I won't do that tonight, don't worry. But we used to sing this psalm together, and so as I read it, I remember how we used to sing together and all. And it's a song, obviously, of praise. And, and in this psalm, uh, David is calling God's people to exalt and to worship the Lord. And I want you to notice what he says here. It's, a, it's an important point. Notice what he says when he says, I will bless the Lord at all times. And so what he's saying here is that praise for God should continually be pouring out of our hearts to the Lord. He's, he's saying, God, I am so grateful to you because you have saved me, and I, and I praise you for that. But it's not only me. When he says, I will bless the Lord at all times, it's not only me, because in verse 2 he says, my soul shall make its boast in the Lord, the humble shall hear of it and be glad magnify the Lord with me, let us exalt His name together. Not only am I going to worship the Lord myself because of what He has done for me, but I want to encourage, He's saying, other people to do the same thing. I will praise the Lord. His praise shall continually be in my mouth, but I don't want to praise Him by myself. So I encourage you to, to, to glory in the Lord and to praise Him. And I want you to notice that because he says in verse 2, My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. I'm not boasting in what I have accomplished. I'm not boasting in the fact that I am a very spiritual man, David would be saying. He's saying, as a matter of fact, if I make a boast at all, it's going to be in the Lord. Now that's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17, when he said, He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. And so he's pointing out that the humble, depending on God and worshiping Him, will, will also rejoice alongside of Him. So he's calling people together to worship the Lord. Psalm 22, verse 22, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. And so my praise is going to be open to the Lord. Not only am I going to praise the Lord, he is saying, but I'm inviting everybody else to praise Him too. Why? Because God is worthy to be praised. That's why. And because the Lord is so, so good. In verse 4, He says, I sought the Lord and He heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. They looked to Him and were radiant. Their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear Him and delivers them. So in my time of fear, in my time of anxiety, I cried out to the Lord for deliverance, and God has heard my cry. And not only that, but, but God's people should all understand that they will not be put to shame if they put their trust in Him. As a matter of fact, they're going to radiate with joy, and they're going to radiate with confidence. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 15, verse 13, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. When the Lord is working in your heart, it has a way of working out in your countenance, and that's the point he's making. He says they're going to be radiant. There's going to be something about them that is very attractive. I remember when I first got saved, and it's true to this day, when you would encounter somebody who knew the Lord, there was just something about that person that was different. When you encountered somebody who knew the Lord, there was just something about them that was different. They radiate the things of the Lord. And so we ought to ask the Lord, if there's joy in our heart, may it work its way out to our face. And may people realize that we actually do have joy that comes from Him. He speaks in verses 7 through 10, picking up at verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear Him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in Him. 
Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. Young lions lack and suffer and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. God is going to provide divine protection for those who fear him. That's what it means in verse 7 when it says, The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. There's an interesting story found in the book of Acts chapter 12. I'd like to cross-reference this verse, verse 7, with that by turning you there. Would you turn with me for just a moment to Acts chapter 12? I want to remind you of a story found in that particular uh, portion of Scripture that can help us to understand a portion of what is being said here when he speaks of the angel of the Lord encamping about the righteous and delivering them. Chapter 12, we have an interesting story. We know that Herod had stretched out his hand, the king, and had stretched out his hand and uh, actually killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And uh, it says in verse 3 here in, in uh, Acts 12, uh, because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. It was during the day of unleavened bread. So when he had apprehended him, put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. When Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers. The guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now, behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. The angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. So he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord, and they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. When you turn on back to Psalm 34, the angel of the Lord encampeth about those who fear him and delivers. And we see a great example of that in the life of the apostle Peter. He has a way of, uh, of delivering us in our time of trouble, and that's what he's speaking about, that God will deliver us. Now, in verse 8, he says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. And I thought about this because just last night, my wife Marie was baking. She loves to bake. And, um, you know, she'll come on up the stairs, and I'll be, high, I'll be in the room. <laughs> I'll be in the room, and, and she'll walk up, and she'll say, Honey, you have to taste this. And, um, and I, I do have to taste it. Because if I, if, I, if I don't, I won't be fed again for the rest of my life. So I do. Actually, she's very good. I shouldn't tease her. I, I just love the way my wife cooks, of course. And, and that, I thought about that. I said, you know, I thought even just before I came out, I was thinking, you know, how, how, how David says, taste and see that the Lord is good. When there is something that you have that you really like, you have a way of handing it to somebody else and say, you got to taste this. This is so good. And you know, I found that to be very, very, to me, that was a, a very strong point because I'm thinking that's exactly what it is. I mean, if you go someplace, and, and I'll tell you, um, you know, my wife, when we go out to eat, my, my wife will want to taste my food. You know, she wants, she reaches over with her fork to taste and see because she'll see how much I'm enjoying it. So she wants to take from me what I enjoy. No, actually, <laughs> she sees I'm enjoying it and she wants to taste of it. And there are times... When I will say, I'll say, honey, you just have to taste this. This is so, so good. And normally it is, though on one occasion, there was something on my plate that looked like a cream puff. You know, it was, it was puffy, and it was filled with white. You know, so I, I, I just took a big old piece of it, and, and, and it was not a cream puff at all. It was sourdough bread, and it had sour cream in it. And, I, and you know when you're thinking this is going to be sweet and you eat it and it's sour, you know? And, and, but what I did is I went, oh, man, this is the sweetest cream puff I have ever tasted in my life. It is so good. And then I handed it to the person who was just dying to taste it and to watch their face because your mind's thinking sweet and it comes out sour. That has nothing to do with this, but I just wanted to show you. 
how mean I can be. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And when the Lord and you are, are when you're getting along with the Lord, you just want other people to experience God. It's an invitation that he's giving here. He's saying God is good. How good is the Lord? Well, obviously the answer is God is so good that he loved us so much that he gave us his son so that we might be with him forever. That's how good the Lord is. And he says you need to taste of that yourself. In verses 9 and 10 when he says, Fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want uh, to those who fear him. Uh, in other words, those who love and trust him will be provided for by him. That's what Jesus meant when he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So he says, There's no lack for those who love the Lord. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Paul in Romans 8.32 said, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So he's saying the Lord will provide for you. Verse 11, come you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil, your lip from speaking guile. Depart from evil, do good, seek peace, and pursue it. How can I have a full life? Well, my life has to be given over to the Lord. What is it that I should do in order that I might be blessed? Well, he says, fear the Lord. Because in the fear of the Lord, there is a promise of a godly life. As a matter of fact, when you have a fear of the Lord, God is going to bless your life. And we ought to understand that. We'll see that again, and it's repeated, and I'll look at that a little closer in a, in a little while. But when he speaks here, it's, it's a point of, of, of teaching us how to live a life that is going to be blessed by God. Verse 13 says, keep your tongue from evil, your lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil, do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So speak lovingly to people. Don't be a deceptive individual. Flee from evil, do good, and seek peace. In Hebrews 12, 14, the Bible says, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them uh, from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all of their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. God hears the cry of those who are broken, and God hears the cry of those who are humble. That's the point he's making. These are people who are aware of their own failings, but they also have a, so a strong and sincere trust in him. When you have a sincere knowledge of your, your own sinfulness, it's not intended to destroy you. It would be used by God to draw you so that you could fall on your face before the Lord and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Because those who come to the Lord with humble repentance are never going to be cast aside by him. And so that's what he's talking about when he says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. They're righteous not by works of righteousness which they've done. They're not righteous because they by nature are righteous. They're righteous because they become righteous through faith in the Lord. Human nature, being what it is, is not not born righteous. I'm rediscovering that with my, with my grandson, Josiah. I'm um, rediscovering that because, you know, he has discovered that, uh, that if he doubles up his fist and takes a punch, he can connect with people, and he kind of enjoys that. And uh, I, I, think that, I think he's related to Raul more than me, but that's, you know, he kind of enjoys that, you know. And, and so we're having to teach him right now that, that it's not good, you know, to be hitting people and all of that. You know, my, my son Joseph was a kid who we would put him in our nursery, and he was less than a year old, but he had his teeth, and, and he was the kid who would, would bite the other kids, you know. And I can still remember a lady calling me up saying to me at my home, she said, we brought my little boy home tonight, and we found a bite mark on his back, and I know Joseph bit him. 
And Joseph was like a year and a half old. What am I supposed to do? Put him on restriction? You know, okay, he can't drive for a month, all right? You know, I mean, what can I do? You can't go out on any dates. And I said, you know what? I, I said, I realize that in a little easy he bites, you know, what can I do? Well, you're going to have to get your kid under control. <laughs> I said, all right. You know, like you can get a year and a half old under control. It takes some time to be able to do that. And so the duct tape did work for a while, but he learned how to take it off. <laughs> it's in the nature. It's in human nature. We become righteous because we make choices to pursue the Lord, and God will, will uh, listen to us as we do so. In verse 17, the righteous cry out, the Lord hears, delivers them out of all their troubles, and the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, save such as have a contrite spirit. And so to me, that has been a very, very dear, dear scripture. It reminds me of Psalm 147 verse 3 which says that God heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds there's no doubt about that the Lord has a, a way of doing that he indeed does that he is near to those of a broken and contrite spirit and perhaps I even have some tonight in this room who are going through a time of sorrow or pain you know and as you humbly take your concerns to the Lord God has a way of not only hearing but he has a way of, 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 of binding up your wounds God will do that he does do that just yesterday, um, rather Monday, we had, uh, and some of you were here with us, we had a uh, celebration of life for, um, for the, uh, in memory of a little girl who was part of our fellowship all her life, and her name is Hannah, and, um, you know, she had eight years, eight years of life and died, uh, you know, in a, in a very sad way and all, and so we as the church gathered together here and and her, her mama and her dad, Susie and, and Jerry, um, they've been in our church forever. I mean, I can remember taking our kids to Logan's Candy in Ontario when my children were, were small. And they would go and try out the candy there that Jerry was selling. And, and then we've known them. I, I'm trying to remember how many years, but it's got to be close, close to 20 years at least. You know, and so um, yes, uh, on Monday we had this, this um, memorial service. And... Uh, and Jerry and Susie have, have seen their daughter graduate. She's gone on to be with the Lord. And on the one hand, you have this sense of sorrow. Of course, it's your eight-year-old baby. There's a lot of things. Every parent here knows what I'm trying to say. There's a lot of things that you had when she was born that you had, you know, planned out. A lot of things. When you, when you hold your baby for the first time, uh, you don't expect to be handing her to the Lord eight years later. Uh, you always expect your children to outlive you, uh, and that's the way we think it ought to be. And, and sometimes it's just not that way. Sometimes the Lord, uh, in His goodness, will, will take our, ch our child to be with Him. And as much as it hurts, uh, the, still the bottom line is, and this is what we kept hearing through Jerry and Susie and the, the testimonies, is, is um, there's not going to be an anger at God. There's not a doubting of the Lord. Uh, there's just a trust in Him. And God is near to those who have a broken heart. And there will be times of tears, and of course there, there will be for some time, uh, but there's not tears of, of sorrow with, with no hope. We don't sorrow as those who have no hope. Uh, we have a hope in Jesus Christ. And, and what it is, it's a, a simple seeing one of our treasures being laid up in heaven that one day we'll receive again to ourselves and we will see her again. And, and, and that is the hope that, that they had even as we were celebrating her life just this last week. Verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. And I find it interesting to note that he says in verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous. And that's the absolute truth, and we know that. We didn't take the easy way out when we came to the Lord. Believers go through extremely difficult times. And though we do go through those times, we go through those times. We don't stay in, in the point of affliction. The Lord has a way of delivering us. God brings us to ultimate safety. So in the midst of trouble, we, ne we need not fear because God is with us every step of the way. Because ultimately, believers enter into heaven because God has redeemed us in Jesus Christ. And we will arrive uh, at home safely. I remember hearing of a missionary, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a pastor who was giving a message and his wife and his uh, daughters had gone on a, a trip. Uh, they were leaving from the point he was at and they were going home. 
And so as he was teaching on a Sunday morning as a guest speaker, somebody came to the platform as he was teaching and drew him aside for just a moment and spoke to him. And he came and stood behind the pulpit and he looked at the congregation and he said, I just received news that my wife and children arrived home safely. And he continued to give the message. And it was only at the end of the message that the people came to realize that his wife and children had actually died on, en route home. They had died on the way to the house. But he said, my children and my wife arrived home safely because he knew that their real home was heaven and it wasn't the location that they were temporarily residing in. That's the point that he's making here. And he's saying that the Lord has a way of delivering us out of those, those things. Even if we go through very hard times of affliction, we arrive at home safely. Now, Psalm 35, continuing, another psalm of David, beginning at verse 1. David writes, Plead my cause, O Lord, with those who strive with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for my help. Also, draw out the spear and stop those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. And so as we pick up in Psalm 35, we need to remember that King David throughout his life had many enemies who desired to harm him or harm to come to him. Sometimes they would simply speak evil of him. Sometimes they would try to physically harm him. So in this particular psalm, David cries out to the Lord for a legal defense as well as military protection. And that's what he's speaking about first in verse 1 when he says, plead my cause. That's a legal cause. He's saying, I want you to be like my lawyer, plead my cause with those who strive against me. But then he says in verse uh, 2, uh, take, uh, take hold of shield and buckler. In other words, provide a defense for me also. And he says, uh, say to my soul in verse 3, I am your salvation. So he's saying, I want you to deliver me, not only redeeming me, but Lord, I'm asking that you deliver me from physical danger. Psalm 50, verse 15 says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. You shall glorify me. So he's saying, Lord, I want you to, deli to deliver me. Verse 4, let those, who, let those be put to shame and brought to dishonor who seek after my life. Let those be turned back and brought to confusion who plot my hurt. Let them be like chaff before the wind. Let the angel of the Lord chase them. Uh, let their way be dark and slippery. Let the angel of the Lord pursue them for without cause they've hidden their net for me in a pit which they've dug without cause for my life let destruction come upon him unexpectedly let his net that he has hidden catch himself into that very destruction let him fall that's a very sweet prayer notice what he's saying here this is his desire that they might have shame dishonor that they might be repelled and confused, that they might be scattered like chaff. These words describe his desire for his enemies to be scattered and, dis and uh, defeated by God. Notice in verse 7 and 8 how he speaks, For without cause they have hidden their net for me in a pit. I, I have done nothing wrong. I have done nothing to deserve such treatment from them. And so, God, may they reap what they are sowing. Uh, the Bible in Proverbs 26, verse 27 says, Whoever digs a pit will fall into it. He who rolls a stone will have it roll back on him. Let them reap what they are sowing. In John 15, verses 23 through 25, Jesus said this. He said, He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. I haven't done anything to deserve this. Now I'm going to look at this in just a moment and give a little more practical application. But verses 9 and 10, uh, My soul shall be joyful in the Lord. Um, it shall rejoice. It shall rejoice uh, in His salvation. All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him. Yes, the, uh, the poor and the needy from him who plunders him. Uh, when you deliver me, everything in me is going to praise you. Fierce witnesses rise up. They ask me things that I don't know. Now look at this. They reward me evil for good to the sorrow of my soul. As for me, 
When they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting. My prayer would return to my own heart. I paced about as though he were my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one who mourns for his mother. In my adversity, they rejoiced and gathered together. Attackers gathered against me, and I didn't know it. They tore at me and did not cease. With ungodly mockers at feasts, they, they gnashed at me with their teeth. Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue me from their destructions, my precious life from the lions. I will give you thanks in the great congregation. I will praise you among many people. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of very practical things about this. David is an innocent man. He's done the best that he can. I want you to notice that when he says in verse 12, they reward me evil for good to the sorrow of my soul. I've only done good to them, and look at how they're treating me. I find it interesting to note that in verse 16 it says, with ungodly mockers at feasts, they gnash the, at me with their teeth. They gather against me, and I didn't even know it. Um, they would go out to eat, and, and David is saying, and, uh, and they would gossip about me. A, a man who had only tried to do them good. As a matter of fact, when I heard that they weren't well, he said, I afflicted my soul with prayer and fasting. I, I sought the Lord for them as if, as if they were my brother. I, when they didn't get well, I, 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 I sorrowed and mourned for them as if it was my own mother. What are you saying, David? Well, I, I'm saying, David would be saying here, I'm saying that they've hated me without a good reason. And by the way, and it hurts. And it hurts. Now, everyone in this room who's lived for a while eventually has somebody say something about you that's just flat out not true. Everybody in this room will go through this more than once in your lifetime where, where people find pleasure in, in gossiping about you. And... And to be honest with you, sometimes the more you try to do good to people, the more wrong with your efforts they can find. About a year and a half ago, it came to my attention that somebody who at one time had been in our fellowship, who had had to be dealt with because he had well, he had he had to be dealt with through his, because of a sin. And uh, when he was addressed, he didn't appreciate the fact that he was being confronted, even though the truth was spoken in love with the heart of restoration. Well, he decided that he was going to leave, and, and so he did. And, and he has choices that he makes, and he made the choice to leave. But it came to my attention that he had gone somewhere, and I'm trying to disguise all the details to the best of my ability here, but he had gone someplace, and as he had done so, he began to speak about me to a person who actually had been saved in our ministry. Though he doesn't go to this church, he respects me and still loves the church here. And so he began to tell him things that were unbelievable. I'll tell you a couple things. One is that we have a dead body that is buried on the church grounds. Now, I've wanted to bury Mike there a few times, but I haven't. <laughs> Another, that we have hired uh, adulterers to be on staff here. And a variety of other things that were just so flat-out evil and so wrong. And he told this person that, and the person called us up and said, I just want you to know that this individual is saying these things about Pastor Dave and all. Mike Callahan and I happened to enter into a restaurant when all of this, just around, right around the same time all of this was going down, and he and a few guys were at a table, and they, he, they know me, they, you know, they knew me as I walked past the table. And you know that sidelong glance and that eyebrow raise and that little whisper kind of thing, that's Rosales over there, the guy who's got the bodies buried on Calvary Chapel, <laughs> Chino Valley Grounds. You know, and I knew what they were doing. You can almost feel their teeth in your back when you walk by, backbiting. You know, and, and, and I'm not going to go into a lot of things, but I can tell you, being in the ministry as long as I have, I've been in the ministry 30 years. In 30 years, 23 years in this church, 
uh, pastoring this church when it began as a Bible study in May and was eventually meeting on Sunday mornings in July. And I can tell you over the years, there have been numerous people who have not appreciated the good that we have tried to do with them. And, and instead of them saying, you know what, I can see and I appreciate and, 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 and I'll, they don't do that. I, I can tell you many times it's been exactly the opposite. And I won't go into any more stories, but there have been, there have been a history of them. You know, and so how do you respond to that? Well, David is saying, listen, he's saying they go out and feast together and the main course is, is, is roast, roast David. You know, they're, they're, they're just, you know, chewing my back up. That's the point he's making. And he's saying, Lord, it's unfair. It's just not right. I've done them good when there have been wrong things in their life. I've wept over them. I can tell you as a minister, I've had people who have been seated across from me where I have honestly, I have wept for them, crying over their situation with tears in my eyes. And they have left only to angrily denounce me, this ministry, and, and uh, to gossip like you wouldn't believe it. I had a guy who, who, who was telling people that I live in a five-story house. I live in a mansion. You know, I take the money from the church. I had another guy who was saying that I use the bookstores for my own profit. I make money off of the books and things there. And there are so many people who say so many evil things. And, and by the way, these aren't, these aren't unbelievers. <laughs> these, aren't, these aren't people out there who just don't like Christ and Christian ministers. These are people who, will, who don't like what they see, and therefore they'll find every reason they can to speak about it. That happens all the time. How do you deal with it? Well, David's saying, listen, Lord, he's saying, I have done the best that I can. I prayed for them. I've cared for them. I've mourned for them. And my heart has been right in this matter. Yet, he says in verse 15, in my adversity they rejoiced, gathered together. Attackers gathered against me. I didn't even know it. They tore at me and did, and it, and did not cease with ungodly mockers at feasts. They gnashed at me with their teeth. Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue me from their destructions, my precious life from the lions. I will give you thanks in the great congregation. I will praise you among many people. Lord, I'm asking that you come to my defense. I'm asking that you just take care of it because I can't. And so because I can't take much more of this, I'm asking for you to, uh, to act on my behalf. And please, Lord, would you cause them to stop? And I know that you will. And I will praise you openly when you do. Verse 19, let them not rejoice over me who are wrongfully my enemies, nor let them wink with the eye who hate me without a cause. For they do not speak peace, but they devise deceitful matters against those who are quiet in the land. They also opened their mouth wide against me and said, Aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. These people have no reason to be so angry with me. They give sly winks to one another, devise lies against those who simply want peace. They falsely say that they have seen me do wrong, acting like they've caught me at it, and I haven't done anything. And that's the point that he's making there. I had a guy who was upset at me at one time because I was driving a red car. And he told me, you're not supposed to have a red car. And I said, really? Why? He says, because it's too showy. I said, a red car is too showy? He said, yeah, what color of the car am I supposed to, to drive? He says, you're supposed to drive a white car. I said, really? And, and why am I supposed to drive a white car? Because it's, because it's a symbol of purity. I said, oh, red is the color of Jesus' blood. Your turn. You know, <laughs> I mean, give me a break here. Anyway, I better move on. <laughs> but they will act as if they've caught you doing something wrong. In verse 22, This you have seen, O Lord. Do not keep silence. O Lord, do not be far from me. Stir up yourself. Awake to my vindication, to my cause, O God and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness, and, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Ah, so we would have it. Let them not say, we have swallowed him up. They're claiming they've seen me in sin. You see what they are really doing. So I'm asking you to rise to my defense and reveal that they are lying about me. Do not let them think that they're getting away with this either, Lord. Let them realize that they're not. Let them, verse 26, be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who rejoice at my hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who magnify themselves against me. In other words, when you vindicate me, it will put an end to their gloating. 
Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. Let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and your praise all the day long. Uh, may those who are my friends rejoice with me when you come to my rescue. Now, Psalm 36. An oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked. There's no fear of God before his eyes, for he flatters himself in his own eyes when he finds out his iniquity and when he hates. The words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. He devises wickedness on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not abhor or reject evil. And so he begins to speak concerning what those who don't know the Lord live like. Notice what he says. He's saying they soothe their own consciences, convincing themselves that they're not that bad. He says their speech is evil and deceptive because it reveals uh, their sinful nature. And he says that they constantly seek ways to do more evil and are committed to continuing in evil. Now, all of this is simply because they have no fear of God before their eyes. They do not fear the coming judgment. And I think that that's the key. As a matter of fact, uh, that is the absolute key to living a righteous life. There are many people, even believers, who have failed to cultivate the wisdom of having the fear of God. And those who don't know the Lord, it is stated throughout Scripture, especially in Romans chapter 3, but other places, that, that there is no fear of God in them. In other words, they think that they will get away with their sinful lives, all of their lives, they'll die, and then still go to heaven if there's such a place. And if there's no such place as heaven, then they're going to become uh, food for the worms, and it doesn't really matter after all. There is no ultimate judgment. In the eyes of many people, there is no ultimate judge. Everybody goes to heaven if there is such a place. We, ha we live in a society right now that is absolutely bent on believing that. There's no doubt about it. And when I as a pastor, when I as a, a, a minister of the gospel, especially when I share uh, clearly on a Sunday morning when we have a large group of people here, and, uh, and very often when I begin to clearly uh, to say this is what God's Word says in, in relation to, to being born again, the necessity of regeneration, and what happens if you refuse that invitation. And there are people who just refuse to believe it. They do not want to believe that they aren't that good. The average person that I encounter, even the worst of the worst, will say that they're not that bad. There are always people worse than them, and they think that God grades on the curve that somehow they're going to make it in on their own merit. And unless you're as good as Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it in because God's standard is perfection. That's what the Word of God teaches, you see. So when that is stated, that's not a popular, popular thing to say today. As a matter of fact, there are many who, who have fallen into the trap, I believe, of tickling the ears of the listener because they are afraid to offend people. But I've discovered that sometimes the truth can be very offensive. Sometimes, sometimes it cuts to the heart. Sometimes it, it actually even hurts your feelings. And I've had, I, you, know, m m you know, I'm old enough to have had more than one conversation where somebody says something about me that I don't want to believe is true, but, but I know in my heart of hearts that it is. You know, and the one person who has the ability to do that the easiest is my wife. Marie is very capable of saying, uh, you're wrong about that. You know, and oh, I'll, I'll argue hammer and tong. You know, I'll give her four reasons and, and even receive an offering. You know, I mean, come on now. <laughs> you know, let's get to the conclusion and the application. What are you talking about, you know? But she's right, and she'll be right. And you know what? Sometimes I, I don't want to hear it because I would love to believe that I am better than I actually am. And if I'm capable of doing that, I guess the average person is too. And, and he's describing uh, this. And, and when, by the way, in verse 1, when he says, an oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked, he's saying the Lord has laid something on my heart that I want to declare to you. This is a word from God. This concerns why people are the way that they are. There is no fear of God in them. Therefore, they do not fear a coming judgment. 
they think they're going to get away with it. Proverbs 3, 7 says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Don't be wise in your own eyes. You have to fear the Lord, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Jesus said this in Matthew 12, 36 and 37. He said, I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it on the day of judgment, for by your words you will be justified. By your words you will be condemned. If you think, in other words, that the message of Christ, and this is what Jesus' context would be, if you think the message of Christ, the, my message of the gospel, the way you can be redeemed is valueless. If you think that you have a philosophy and a wisdom that is beyond that of God Himself, you will give an account of that in the day of judgment. You will explain yourself before God, as the point He's making, and say why you thought it was wise to attempt to enter into the kingdom of God in your own merit. And so he's speaking concerning these people who basically have no fear of God. In verse 5, your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgments are a great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. And so he's contrasting. He's in contrast to the evil surrounding me. Your attributes have given me strength to live. You have given me your mercy. You are faithful. You are righteous. And, and you are just. And, and this all provides inner strength because your righteousness uh, in that you provided for salvation to the sinner and judgment uh, to those who are uh, unwilling to come is declared very clearly. And therefore, I have learned to trust you. When he says, How precious is your loving kindness, O God, therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house. And you give them drink from the river of your pleasures, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. He's basically saying you give life and you give light to those who are walking with you so that they might walk safely in this world. You protect them and you cause them to be able to experience the life that is abundant that comes through you. That's what he's saying in verse 8. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house. Jesus said, I have come to give you life and that more abundantly. I will give you an abundant life. I was talking to someone just the other day. And they're making a decision that relates to uh, the car that they're driving. And I was talking to them. You know, I enjoy talking to young people like that. And I said, just be very careful when you buy your car. And they don't want to hear an old man talking to them about like that, but I, I do anyway. I said, be careful. Why is that? I say, be careful that you don't get caught up in an image. Be careful that you do not get caught up with the exterior. If I say to a young person, and I've got a few young people in here right now and some who think they're young. <laughs> if I say to a young person, uh, what kind of car would you like? And we'll say the person's in their early 20s. Oh, I would like, and you'll hear all kinds of cars. I'd like a, a Porsche. I'd like a, a BMW. I'd like a Mercedes. I'd like a, you know. They never say, I'd like a Kia. <laughs> they never do. Kia, Kia's a great car. It's got a 100,000, you know, mile guarantee on its powertrain. You know, Hyundai's are great cars. They're good cars. As a matter of fact, they've overtaken Toyota. They're a good car. But it's the image it's the image. They would rather, I, I can't, I'll, I'll, make, I'll just bring this on home in a personal thing with my, my daughter, Anna. I said, listen, hon, you you've got X amount of dollars that you can spend on your car to get a car after her, her car had been totaled. I will buy you a tank next time. But um, I said, you got X amount of dollars, honey, and this is what you can look at. And I began to name some cars, and all of them within the same dollar price range. Man, if you say Kia or you say Hyundai, you know, no way, Dad, I'm going to get those cars. Why not? They're great cars. They're just not, uh, what? They're not cool, huh? They're not cool cars. Is that it? Well, you know, yeah, yeah. Image is everything, isn't it? Isn't it? And there are people, eh, might as well continue. I'm getting in trouble. I'll, I'll just continue. Um, <laughs> there are people who are going broke for image, going broke for the image. They have the nice car, but they don't have a house because they're renting. But they got the nice car, 
and they can be twenty, thirty. I've spoken to people thirty-five, forty thousand dollars in credit card debt. You know, they're they're living the style. They, they they've got the outward appearance. And so when I was speaking to this young person the other day about the car, I said, "Listen," I said, "Jesus Christ said this." He said, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. He said, it's the pagan who seeks after what he eats, what he drinks, and what he puts on. He said, if you seek the kingdom of God first, all of these things shall be added unto you. Establish your priorities correctly and watch God bless your life. You will be satisfied with what he gives you. But if you think you're going to be satisfied with what you're driving, you will be satisfied until the first payment comes. And you have to make this payment for another 60 or 72 months because people are not going three years anymore. They're going you know, 60 and 72 months. And by the fourth year of driving the car, they're tired of it, but they got two more years to pay. And by that time, all the new models have come out, and, and this car's already got 150,000 miles, and I want to get a new car, but you haven't even touched your principal because you've been paying on the interest. Listen to an old man. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. And so, so what if the car you know, have smoke signals as you're driving on down the street, you know. <laughs> and I was, you know, and I was talking, I was saying, you know, because uh, this young person, I was saying, one day as you meet a young lady and you want to get married, you're going to enter into marriage with a debt that you can't service. You have to be wise that you lay your priorities down straight when you're young. Because if you're not, then you're going to enter into a debt service that you don't want to handle once you are married. Be careful because you see a lot of us oldies in this room remember what it's like when you first got you know, together and you, you got married and, and you, you rented this cheesy little apartment and you had this, just this, this couch with the springs that would remind you that you needed a better couch. You know? When Marie and I, our first couch cost us 10 bucks. And, and, you know, and, and, and we, put a, we put some cover over it and everything. And, and, and we, we, had, we didn't have anything other than each other and the Lord, and that's all we needed. And, and uh, today, though, the young people say, listen, I want to have this big old wedding, you know. And, 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 and man, the average cost of weddings are anywhere from thirty to $50,000. I want to have this great big wedding now, and I want to have the reception. I want to have the limousine. I want to have all of this. And then six months later, they divorce. And it makes no sense. It makes no sense. You know, and I've told my kids, listen, you've got a couple options. You want to get married, praise God, please do, and soon. But, <laughs> you know, you've got options. Either you can have the nice show or a nice uh, honeymoon. What do you want? You can have the big party and all your friends there. You see, because some of the kids getting married today think it's almost like a, a ticketed event. You know, if I, if I get a lot of people, they're going to give me a lot of money. It's not a dollar dance anymore. It's a $10 dance. It's a $20 dance, you know. It's just, it's almost a money-making operation. They're just losing sight of what, what it's all about. Am I talking to myself? I don't think so, you know. It's a money-making operation, you know, and it's true. you got to watch out because you're losing sight of what's important. And we've got to keep our eyes on the things that the Lord would have for us. And we need to understand that God will satisfy us. He is the one who abundantly satisfies us. And he says so in verse 8. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house. You give them drink from the river of your pleasures. So what is it that you want? Well, for me, I want to drink of the water of life. I want to have life more abundantly, a quality of life that, that is not uh, predicated on what I drive, what I eat, where I live. I want it to be just the pleasure of the Lord. He says in verse 10, Continue your loving kindness to those who know you, your righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of pride come against me, and, and let not the hand of the wicked drive me away. Uh, there, there, are, there the workers of iniquity have fallen. Uh, they have been cast down and are not able to rise. And so he closes very briefly here by simply saying, uh, Continue to protect me so that my integrity will be preserved. You see, Lord, the proud and the wicked oppose me serving you, so please don't allow them to influence me. And may the kingdom of evil cease to exist, and may your kingdom reign on earth. And Lord, I'm asking, he's saying, 
that you would, that you would do this for your own pleasure. It reminds me of what Paul said in Romans 16, 20, when he said, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Lord, you rule, you reign. Do not let the wicked drive me away. O oh Lord, you cast them down. You rule, you reign, and you rule and reign through me. May I have the abundance that you provide, and my, may my joy and, and my priorities be centered on your kingdom.